your hands together for God. Give God some praise. Isn't he worth our praise? Doesn't he deserve our praise? Isn't God good? I know that God is good in my life, so no one has to tell me to praise. I know I'm going to give God glory because God has been really good to me. I know Brian, and I don't deserve it, so I will give God his praise. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful God. Feel free to be seated. God, you are so good. What a privilege to be in the presence of God. You know, we could really take it for granted sometimes that we're in God's presence, that we're in God's house. Not everyone has that opportunity. There's a lot of people that are hiding just to worship God. We have an opportunity to freely, openly praise God, give God glory. Sometimes we take it for granted. God, I worship you. You're such a great God. You're such a good God. I am so privileged to be here today. It's just an honor to stand before you and to speak today. I want to, is it okay if I just speak to you a little bit about the making of the message? You know, so I want to tell you a little bit about how this message came to be, because oftentimes you hear a preacher say, that God gave me the word. And God has never spoken to me literally so that I can hear him. But he's actually placed enough things in line. And he's lined them up enough that I'm like, that could not be me. That had to be God. <laughs> eh? And so I want to speak a little bit about the making of the message. And in reality, this message came, to, came about in four different places, in four different parts. This message started to come together. I really actually heard it the first time it at, while I was at home. Actually, in my bathroom is where I actually heard it the very first time. And then the second time that this word started to come together is when I was really at the top of a mountain, like a literal mountain. I was up there, and this word started to come together. And then the third time is when I was overlooking the ocean and looking at a sunset over the ocean. And then the fourth time that this message came and it actually started to pull together was when I was actually in a restaurant, a Vietnamese restaurant on top of that. <laughs> And God started to speak. And so let's see how he pulls it together the same way that he pulled it together for me. Is that okay? Okay. So if, you, if you're able to stand, please stand and I'll read the verse that he gave me in my bathroom. That's okay. And it's in, it comes from Psalms 134. Psalms 134. It says, By the river of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the pulpers we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for a song. Our torturers demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the song of the Lord while we're here in a foreign land? Many of you may have heard that. How can we sing the Lord's song in this foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy, my highest joy. As you're seated, if you could just turn to your neighbor and give them the title of my message, it's called When the Dam Breaks. When the Dam Breaks. And you may be seated. And as you're seated, you can turn to the other neighbor and say, Brian did not bring you to church a cuss. <laughs> it's a grown folks word, not a cuss word. <laughs> when the Dam Breaks. So I want to start off by quoting a great historian and philosopher, Forrest Gump. <laughs> and he says, life is like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. Exactly. And so really what he was saying is that like, in that box of chocolate, there can be so many different things, types of chocolate in there. And it's just like life. Life just brings a number of things at you at different times yes. and different periods in your life. Yes. Yes. And because I'm not a huge chocolate eater, I'll relate it, to, relate it to something that I'm more 
um, familiar with. So I'll relate life to sports. Sports is a lot like life. Everything is okay. Everything is fine when you're winning. <laughs> when you're winning, it's all good. Think about your favorite football team. They could have a horrible quarterback. Pastor Chase is not here today to speak about the Texans. I'll leave it alone. But your favorite team can have a horrible quarterback, just terrible. He threw four interceptions in the first quarter alone. And just as long as your team kicks the winning field goal with no seconds left on the clock, you're like, they're the best team in the world. They're great. They're going to the Super Bowl. You don't want to change a single thing, even though they're horrible. Everything is fine. Everything is good when you are winning, when things are going well. And it's not just for, for professional sports. You, if you are a parent of an athlete, a little kid, everyone thinks that their little Johnny and little Jane is going to be the next LeBron. <laughs> everyone does. And your kid can be playing a sport you don't even understand. You don't even know if you like it. They're dribbling the ball up the field. They finally kick it towards the net, and it dribbles into the net. The goalie jumps, dives, hurts herself, and the goalie's crying it out there. And you're like, um, no offense, but are they going to count that goal? <laughs> like, you're, as long as you're doing okay, others may not be, but as long as you're doing okay, life is good. Everything is okay. Isn't that how life really is sometimes? And really, you may not relate it to sport. You may relate to something like vacation. When you're on vacation, everything's fine. It's okay. We're on vacation. You can wake up at one in the morning and your seven-year-old is still watching TV. And you're like, what are you doing up? It's one in the morning. And your spouse comes in the room and says, it's okay, it's okay. We're on vacation. And you're like, okay, lock up when you're ready. You know. Or your 16-year-old is on vacation and you found out they haven't taken a bath in three days. <laughs> three days. And you're like, are you ever going to take a bath? And they're like, it's okay, I'm going swimming tomorrow. It's fine. <laughs> and you're like, okay, I guess it's fine. It's vacation. And actually, speaking of vacation, Paulette and I was able to take a couple of days and go on vacation a little while back. And we were able to drive through a place called Canloops. And it's a beautiful spot, and we were able to drive through Canloops, and we drove up to Kelowna. And Kelowna is a gorgeous part to be. And we knew that we were only stopping there for a bit before driving through to get to Vancouver, British Columbia. Just an outstanding part of the country to be. If you ever have an opportunity, I'm encouraging you to go and take a look at it. It is God's country. God was really standing there when he made that spot, just an outstanding spot. And I remember we were right at the top of a mountain in Kelowna, and it was just an amazing mountain, and it felt like I could stand there and I could see the entire world. It looked like I could see another country from there. We're that high up. Matter of fact, I have a picture, and this is, this isn't a, I didn't say we're great photographers, <laughs> but, you know, so, but this is the area that it was with, and it was, it was just just an amazing spot. And you know, we could actually stay right there and spend our whole time right in this area. But we had a vision of where we we're going to. And we knew we wanted to get to Vancouver. And a matter of fact, I'll show you a picture of where we we're going to. And so that's where we we're heading. And so we knew we wanted to get there. But where we were at that time just felt like we wanted to spend some time. And isn't that what we do sometimes? When God is blessing us, we don't really want to move. We want to stay right here. When our kids are in that good stage, we don't want them to grow. We don't want them to speak. We don't want them. We just want them to stay right there. When our finances is good, God, just keep it right here. You know, oh, you can give me a little bit more, but just to keep it. You know, when our relationship, we don't want to move. And that's really what it felt like when we were in that one spot. We are at the mountain and I was looking over and saying, what an amazing spot. Look at what God has done. Look at how good God is. And I really didn't want to move, but I knew God had something else for us if we moved a little bit further. And that's what really happens sometimes when life is good, when things are going well. A matter of fact, when things are going well, we as Christians, we as humans usually do one of two things. The first thing that we could do is we could lean in to God 
and acknowledge him for his goodness and his blessings and all that he has done. As I was standing there on the mountain, I remember looking and I say, God, you are so good. Look at what you created. Look at what you did. Look at how, and God, you brought me here. God, you are so good. I know it wasn't because of me or my goodness. It was because of you. When things are going well, this is a perfect opportunity for us to lean in and acknowledge God for his goodness in our situation. But the second thing that we can do, sometimes we can lean in, but other times we can actually get caught up in his blessings. And we can start to worship his creation more than we worship the creator. We can start to worship the blessings more than we worship the one that actually blessed us. And a matter of fact, we can go in between that very often. And I think about the children of Israel. And so the scripture we read before, this this was their great, great, great grandparents. When God was delivering them out of Egypt and out of Pharaoh's hand, God actually delivered them out of Pharaoh's hand through the Red Sea. God separated the Red Sea, caused it to stand on its head, allowed them to come out through dry land. The Red Sea was applauding them while they were walking through. God really opened up a miracle for them. They saw the Red Sea split. And they walked into the desert. And while in the desert, instead of remembering God who created them, they were thinking about his creation. They were saying, but how could you bring us into this desert where we have no meat and we have no cucumber and we have no onions? They were worried about onions (laughs) instead of the creator. And God was patient with them. And God said, okay, okay, I will provide you food. And God literally gave them bread, manna, every morning, every afternoon, every night. They didn't have to hunt for it. They didn't have to look for it. They didn't have to fight for it. God provided it to them every day. But when we get comfortable with God's blessing, what do we often do? Look for more. And God, what's next? And what's next? And what's next? And God even showed them, this is your promised land. Here's where I'm going to give you. And they looked at it and they said, this looks amazing. The grapes are huge and the blessings are right there. And it's going to give us everything we want and everything we need. This looks great, except those people in there, they look like giants. And they're going to take us over, so we're not going to go. And the thing is, because of their doubt, they ended up dying right there in the wilderness. Only two people from their generation actually walked into the promised land because of their doubt. And then God had to take a new generation into the promised land. They didn't walk through the Red Sea. They didn't remember the Red Sea experience. So God had to separate the Jordan and give them their own experience. God had to give them their own wall of Jericho experience. God had to give them their own experience living in the promised land. And they lived in there and worshiped and acknowledged God until they became too accustomed to his blessings and started to worship the gifts more than the giver. And we can say, how is this possible that they would do this? But we do it also. We vacillate between God's goodness and taking God for granted. Think about it. God blesses us with a new job and you say, God, I don't deserve it. Thank you so much, God. It's providing all that I need. It's providing all that I want. God, I don't deserve it. I thank you. And then six months into the job, you can't come to church because you're working at the job. Six months later, you can't pay tithes because, God, you didn't give me enough. And you're not cussing out the supervisor at that same job that you said, God, you gave me. Why? Because we get too accustomed to it and we forget who actually gave it to us and it wasn't because of our own goodness. Or we think we have to climb that corporate ladder and put in time when God is one that gave it to us so God can climb it for us. We get caught up even in our children and we say, God, you gave it to me. You gave them to me. I don't deserve them. God, I wasn't even sure I could even have them. And you blessed me with them. You brought them through through an adoption when I couldn't even qualify for it. God, they are yours. But you would take them to every game and you would take them to every performance and you would take them, give them a speech classes and everything just for them to get a leg up. But remember what gave you the, who gave you them? 
God is the one that will give them the leg up. God is the one that will make them successful, put them into his hand. Sometimes we even struggle bringing them to the house of God because we're bringing them everywhere else. And yes, we want them to be successful. And yes, we want them to grow up to be productive. But you know how they're going to be productive? Bringing them to the house of God. And just one other thing, you know where they're really going to be su successful? Sending them to their class so that they can learn. Yes, it's nice that you're cuddling them in here and that's fine, but take them out of your hands and put them in God's hands. Let them learn on their level. Let them care about the goodness of God. You know why I'm here? It's because I learned over there. You know why I'm over, after learning over there, I learned there. Let them learn on their level. Let them hear about the goodness of God. When I hear my God child come home and speak about God and what God, I'm like, that's what they need to hear. They don't need to play on your phone in service. Sorry, maybe I'm meddling too much. That's a pastor's duty. So I stood, we were at the top of that mountain and it was a gorgeous spot. And I was looking and I realized that we had to, we were at one mountain and we had to go to another mountain. But there wasn't a bridge. And so at some point we had to go through this situation. And I remember thinking at this, this is such a beautiful spot. This would be an outstanding spot to see where the sun, that the sun set and to see the sunrise. This would be an awesome spot to camp out and just see the sunset. And then I realized I don't camp. <laughs> a friend of mine continues to try to get me to go camping and I tell him that camping is practicing homelessness. <laughs> and I never really want to perfect it. And so, but it was just, But it, it was just a great spot to be in. And as we sat there, I started, to, I started to look at this and I started to realize if we have to get over there, we have to start going through this. And then we started to make our way down this hill. And we realized that, you know, this is a little bit of a hill to go down. This could get a little bit sticky at some point. The radio, we were listening to the radio and we were listening to some great educational things. We learned a whole lot listening to the radio during that time. And then, but the radio started to get a little staticky. And I remember at some point we, trying to hear, we were trying to hear that story. And so we we're trying to change it to a different station to see if we could pick it up. But it was getting staticky as we were going down. We were actually speaking to someone on the phone and the phone, the lines were getting quite spotty. And the phone actually dropped at one point. And the person called us back and said, if you didn't want to speak to me, all you had to say is, is, is that you want to speak to us. Isn't that how people are when we're starting to go through stuff? They think it's about them. And in reality, we're like, it's a spotty network. God is moving through this situation. And so we're going through this. And at some point, we saw these signs that said, break check. And we kept seeing them every uh, like half a mile or something. And we're like, what is this break check thing? And then we realized that they were encouraging people to pull off and check your brakes. Whenever they have to encourage you to check your brakes when you're going down a hill, you know that this can get scary. And that's the whole thing is that when you start going through stuff, when you start going through problems and going through difficulties, what do you do? What do we do when we start to go through problems, when problem comes? Can I tell you what we often do as human? We often revert back to our default we revert back to our default. And what that simply means is that we've been practicing patience and we've been practicing positivity and we've been practicing calm. We've been praying and we've been worshiping. But when problem comes, we revert back, right back to our default. We get angry and we yell and sometimes we start cussing and then we're like, well, where was, what was up? What about all the things that we've been practicing all this time? We become angry and sometimes we can become abusive. We revert back to our default when problems happen. And some people say, well, we're just reverting back to who I am. That's how God created me. That's my factory setting, as if we're computers. 
But you know what? I'll actually argue that our default is different than our factory setting. Because in reality, our default is the behaviors that we, um, that, and our tendency that we revert back to when we go through challenging situations. It may be things that we don't like, it may be things that we don't want, it may be things that we don't even want to do, but we revert right back to it when we're in bad situations, when we're in struggling. The difference is our factory setting is the way that our, we were originally constructed by our creator. The way that God actually created us in the very first place, very different than our default. See, that's what Jeremiah 1 verse 5 spoke about, our factory setting when he said that God called us, God knew us, God molded us, God formed us, God formed us and molded us and spoke to us, God whispered into us before he even placed us in our mother's womb. That's our factory setting. In Psalms 139 when it says that God created us in our innermost places, God saw us long before we even came to this earth. And God started to speak to us and mold us and form us. God knitted us together. God says, I know that you're going to need a little bit of patience. I'm going to place a little. I know you're going to go through that situation. You're going to get that call. You're going to get that notification. I know your child may be in prison at some time and you're going to need help. So I'm going to put some courage. And then God started to knit you together and bring you together exactly how he needs you to be. That's your factory. That's how he assembled you. That's your factory setting. That's how God brought you together. It said, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in the book before a single one came to be. Before one came, God, you knew everything about me. So when you're hard on yourself and said, I'm too big or I'm too small, my head is too large or my ears are too small, God created you exactly like that. And God placed enough security in you for you to be comfortable in your own skin. God is the one that created you just the way you are. What we perceive far too often as our factory set in, Far too often, God didn't make us like that. What we say, that's just the way that I was made. Is it a possibility that instead of that's just the way that you were made, it's that because of the things that you've witnessed, because of the things that you've experienced, because of the things that you've gone through, it's allowed that to now be your factory setting. That's now your factory setting. You say, I'm explosive and I'm angry. Every time I get angry, I'm angry just like every male in my family. That's your default setting, not your factory. I drink far too much. And I know I drink too much, but it's numbing all of those experiences of my past. Your default. Your default setting. I come in late to work and I leave early all the time. Why? Because everyone does it. What are you exposing yourself to? You're setting up default settings in your life. Yes. And can I be honest? You're actually exhibiting those same defaults to your children and to others around you. And when they start acting the exact same way, it's not their factory setting. It's your default setting from what they see that you're doing also. I find myself in the same relationship over and over and over, even though I swear I would never be there. Our default setting. I'm going to hurt him before he hurts me. Because no one can be trusted. Those are all our default settings. We revert back to our default, our common, our comfortable, our habits. Even if we hate those behaviors. But maybe what we should be is going back to our factory setting. Maybe we should be asking God, what is it that you saw in me? What is it that you placed in me? What is it that you want from me? 
I don't want to be angry like this anymore. I don't want to be in this situation anymore, God. You use me, God. You call up in me. You bring up in me, God, what you stir up in me, Heavenly Father, God. What you placed in me, God, before I was born. What you said to me, God, in Jeremiah, you start stirring that up in and through me, Heavenly Father, God. I want to get back to my factory setting. I'm tired of living in my default. I was actually sitting in a restaurant while I was away. And I was by myself in this restaurant, a Vietnamese restaurant. And I was really not people watching. I went to one corner and I was there by myself because I just, God was just speaking to me and I wanted, and I was writing and I was typing as much as possible because I was just hearing from God. And he was speaking to me about default and how we often refer back to our default instead of referring back to him. And as I was focusing and listening, a family walked in. It was a, a lady and a man, and they walked in, and it was, they were with a boy around age 16, 17, and a young girl at around age 8. And when they walked in, the lady was really loud. And she was yelling at this guy and giving him the business while they're walking into this restaurant. And I was really trying to concentrate. I wasn't really listening to what they were saying, but she was really loud. And at some point, I couldn't write anymore. I had to stop at this point. And so I just started to eat. And she was speaking to, after she finished giving him the business, she ended up, she turned to their son and she was speaking to him, speaking to him about school and about grades and about credits that he needed. And when she finished talk, talking to him, he looked like he was relieved and he turned around and he punched his sister. I don't know exactly what she was saying. I just got the pieces of this. I really wasn't listening. Well, kind of. <laughs> and then his sister, his sister turned and sort of nudged him. And, and the mother turned to the sister and said, I know he hit you, but you don't need to hit him back. When he goes low, you need to go high. And she, she started quoting Obama at that, this point. And I was like, okay, I... And the daughter, every time she was quoting, he, the daughter was getting a little bit more excited and she nudged her, her brother again and she turned around and pushed him and the mother was like, what are you doing? What have you become? Where did you get this? What are you doing? And she turned around, the little girl turned around and punched her brother in the arm and her mother almost lost her mind. Where did you learn all of this? What have you become? And the girl started eating her noodle, didn't say a single thing and just pointed to her mother. <laughs> default setting. Sometimes the thing that we hate the most is not the way that we were born, not the way God created us, but it could be what we've witnessed, could be what we've experienced, and could be what we've exposed to. We often refer back to our default setting. And I could imagine the children of Israel doing this exact same thing when they were in Babylon. They were struggling, and they may have reverted right back to their default setting. And the thing is, they may have gone through all five stages of grief at that point. They may have been in shock at that point, denial at that point. I can't believe we're here. How did we get here? We are the children of God. How are we in captivity? How are, where is God during this time? They could have been stunned. They could have been in this bargaining, bargaining stage and they're saying, God, if you just rescue us, God, if you just save us, God, if you just do that, I will serve you all of my life. I will turn my life. I will never go back to worshiping what you've created and not you. They could have been in a state of depression. Depression. They could have been in anger, yelling, there is no God. God, I don't trust you. I don't even know if there's a God. And just before they got to acceptance, just before they say, God, I don't understand, but I'm going to accept. I don't know where you are, but I'm going to trust you. Just before they got there, they reverted right back to anger, right back to their factory setting. And they were mad. They were angry. As we were going down that hill, it started to get pretty scary. This wasn't a hill. As we were going down that, plunging down this mountain, it started to get pretty scary. We started going quite fast. At some point, Paulette said, 
uh, are you, aren't you going to slow down a little bit? And I'm like, I'm not even touching the gas. I'm hovering over the brake at this point. I'm not touching the gas at all, but we're going pretty fast. The radio went completely out. There was like no signals at that point. The phone, we had no reception at all. I remember at one point turning to her and said, this would be a scary place to get stranded because there's very few people around and we have no coverage around at this point in time. A matter of fact, it was really sunny and bright at the top of the mountain. But as we were going through, it became really dark because the mountains were on both sides and we're flying down this mountain. We're plunging down this mountain at this point. And I remember there was one thing that was odd to us. We, there were two lanes that we were going down, and at some point there were some long stretches, but it was quite a windy road where you really had to hit your brakes at that point. But at some point down, down these long stretches, there were, we were, there were two lanes going down, but there's this third lane that would progressively come, and the lane wouldn't be very long, and then it would rear off, and it would go up a gravel hill and into the woods. And I thought, who is the crazy person camping out there? But as we kept seeing that, we were wondering, what is that? And then we realized that it actually is a, what they refer to as a runaway lane. And that simply is, if you didn't check your brakes when they said brake check, and you cannot stop, you're going down that lane, up that gravel, and you hope you stop in the woods before going over. That means it could get really serious. When trouble happens, when problem happens, when you just when you think that nothing else can go wrong, then you hit rock bottom. Just when you think nothing else can go wrong, you hit rock bottom. That's where the bottom falls off. That's where the, the dam breaks, when you think nothing else can go wrong. The children of Israel in Psalms 137 says, how can you ask us to sing the Lord's song in a foreign land when we're in captivity, when we're not even allowed to worship our own God? But shortly after that, they were forced to make a decision. After they started to think about, I remember what it was like when I was living in Zion. I remember what it was like when I was living for God. I remember what it was like when I was on the mountain. And then they started to think about all of the things that they had, all the people that had died on their track from Jerusalem to Zion. And when we think about all the things that we've lost in our lives, just like them, we could start crying. And they started weeping. When they thought about all the people they've lost, they started weeping. When they thought about all the things that they've lost, they started weeping. When they th thought about their city, the city that David built, the, wor the churches that he built, the temple they built to worship God, and God was right there with them. They started to weep when they think about all that they've lost during this time. When you've hit your rock bottom, sometimes all you can do is cry. You don't know what to say. You don't know who to speak to. You don't know where to go. What do you do when you've hit your rock bottom? What do you do when the dam has broken? All you can do sometime is just weep. Just weep. When they thought about the cruelty of their captors, when they thought about the bleakness of their future, when they thought about their own sin that got them to where they are, all they could do is weep. When we've hit our rock bottom and we don't know what else to do, we don't know what else to say, we don't know who to call on, we, we've prayed our last prayer, we've called every friend, they've encouraged us in every way we can, but we're just in a desperate state at this point. When you've done all you can do, and all you can do at that point is weep. Yes. What do you do when you've cried your last tear? You have to trust him. Amen. Trust God. Yeah. You have to trust him.
What do you do when the dam is broken? You have to trust God. You have to find a way to hold on, to trust him in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of the problem, in the midst of the diagnosis, in the midst of the medical um, call, when you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know where to turn and all the friends have deserted you. You're going to have to turn to him and trust God. God, I don't know where you are. I haven't heard from you in a while, God, but I'm going to hold on to you anyhow, God. I'm going to hold on to hope God you've given me hope God and that's all I can hold on to not this fancy little pretty hope God but the hope that you kept me God in the past when I was on the mountain that God is the God I'm holding on to the God that says God that you have orchestrated my future that's the God I'm going to hold on to I'm going to hold on to you I'm going to hold on to you I don't know what else to do but I'm going to hold on to you God to you I'm going to hold on to you when you've cried your last tear trust God trust God see the children of Israel said how can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land when you're going through, that's exactly when you need to sing the Lord's song. In a strange land, in a hard place, in a difficult situation. I don't understand it, the dam's broken. All hell is breaking loose, but God, I praise you. God, I serve you. God, I'm gonna hold on to you. God, I don't like it, God, but I'm gonna do it anyhow. I don't know when you're going to come through, but I'm going to do it anyhow. I don't see my child turning around, but I'm going to hold on anyhow. God, I trust you. They call it cancer, but I'm going to trust you. They call it diabetes, but I'm going to trust you. They call it a medical impossibility, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you anyhow, God. When do you call on God? You call on him in a strange land. When everything else looks wrong, you trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Jesus, I'm going to trust you. Jesus, I'm going to praise you. The word of God says, they quickly turned around and they said, oh, Jer oh, Jerusalem, if I forget you, if I forget how good God has been to me in the past, may my right hand lose its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. Another translation says, if I forget God, if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my fingers wither away and like a leaf. May my tongue dry up and, and die. If I forget my greatest Jerusalem, if I forget God, when all hell breaks loose, that's when you gotta trust him most. That's when you gotta trust God. The scripture says, those who sow in tears, all those crying, shall reap joy. You may not know what to do. You may not know who to turn to. You may be simply weeping because you've said everything you can say. But weeping only endures for a night. Weeping only endures for a night and then joy, joy. Joy coming in the morning time. Joy is on its way. Joy is coming. Joy is coming on the backside of that problem. Joy is coming. Deliverance is coming. Peace is coming. Your child is coming. Finance is coming. Your job is coming. Prosperity is coming. He's bringing it all back. He's bringing it all back. All that you've lost in that dark time, he's bringing it all back. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Your joy is coming back. 
God has not left you. God has not forsaken you. He's been with you the whole time. The whole time God was right there. You may not were, you weren't able to see him, but God was right there. God was right there. God is right here. If today you are in the middle of your season that you're wondering, God, where are you? You barely made your way to church today. You're doubting if God can open up a way. God is right here, right in your midst, right in the middle of your situation. See, when we finally hit rock bottom when we're driving through and the horrors of coming down that hill finally slowed down, just like when we're going through trouble, we can wonder, God, are you even here? Where are you? Why don't you speak? Why don't you speak? All I need is one sign. Remind me that you're here. Remind me that you haven't left me. As we were driving, when we finally hit rock bottom, there were two signs that reminded me that God never left us. God never left us. The very first sign was, as we were driving, we continued to see this street sign, but we were plunging so fast down the hill that we couldn't actually read it. And when we finally hit rock bottom and started coasting, we finally read what the sign said. And it said, the next city is the city of hope. Hope. Hope was flashing the whole time. And we didn't even know. It said to get to the city of hope, we needed to exit next exit, which was flood hope. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God's going to raise up a standard. God's going to speak in ways he's never spoken before. God's going to move in ways he's never moved before. God's going to show up and show out in a way he's never done before. God's going to speak in ways you've never heard God speak before. God's going to show hope in ways he's never showed you before. God said, I was there the whole time. When we were just holding on for great, for good, for life, God was there the whole time showing us sign after sign after sign that he was there, that he was right there. He was right there with us, just reminding us to hold on. And the second sign, as we were looking at that sign go by, we don't even know when the radio came on because it just came on so softly. And it was no longer playing these educational things that we're listening to. And I don't even remember when the song came, but I remembered this exact verse. It said, I am calling on the God of David who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I am facing my own giant. That's when I realized 